So if you remember last time, we could relate the velocity and acceleration of two points on a rigid body together, right? So our two big formulas that we have learned so far in this chapter is if A and B belong to the same rigid body. Then we can say V of A is equal to V of B plus omega cross R of A with respect to B and A of A is equal to A of B plus alpha cross R of A with respect to B. And then plus omega cross omega cross r of a with respect to b. So these two are valid if and only if a and b are on the same rigid body. But there are problems when we are dealing with kinematics of rigid bodies where we need to relate the velocity or acceleration of two points together however these two points do not belong to the same rigid body one example is here this is a mechanism where it has two links and here you have this small knob or tab whatever you want to call it and this has to slide inside this uh, basically slot which is uh, on the object on the left, on the uh, uh, part on the left. So, first thing you might wonder is, does this move at all? I mean, if I rotate one, is the other one going to rotate as well? Or no, it's just stationary. How do I know in the first place, when somebody shows me something like this one, or this one, or the other one here, this one or this one, how do I know if they move or not? And how do I know how many inputs I should provide to the system to get one output? Because not always it's that simple, okay? And that's the topic that we are missing in this textbook. And actually, ideally you should see that in a separate course. There is a separate course that we don't have here but it is called Mechanism Synthesis and Analysis, and that's where you see how several rigid bodies together move and how they can form mechanisms, how they can form structures. And then uh, you see about more about gears, about cams and camshafts and so on. But since we don't have that, before I get into depth of this, I first want to discuss this very important thing of, and this is not in your textbook and not even in the lecture, so if you want to take notes, do so, please. How do I know if something is moving or not? For example, in this case here, I have one member on the left and one member on the right. So here I have one member, and then let's say if I change it a little bit like this. Yeah, it's, it's really hard to write properly on. I have to turn my laptop and make it non slippery so that I can write something. Okay, and this is a pin. And here you have another pin, and this member is pinned to the ground. And then here you have another pin, and this guy is also pinned to the ground. Is this guy going to move? If I call it ABC, and at B, the two members are pinned together. If I rotate one of this, as the other, or if I can even rotate AB in the first place, can I move any of these? How do I know? What's the difference between that one and this one that we just saw? 
You know, you might say one has pinned, the other one has this slide. That's right. And this one does move, the other one does not. So how do I know? So this comes from something called the Grubler's formula, and I want to discuss it with you. So for 2D mechanisms, okay, for 2D mechanisms, for 2D, and let's not call it mechanism, for 2D rigid bodies, the degree of freedom for a connected set of rigid bodies can be calculated by the Grubler's formula. Okay, so Grubler is the name of the person who came up with this formula. And there is proof behind it but again we are not gonna talk about too much about the proof of it or something but uh, I'll show you this uh, important formula in action with several examples and you see that it completely makes sense so this is what it says so when you have an object in 2d like any of these members how many degrees of freedom do you have for one single rigid body you know it's three, right? So an object in space has six degrees of freedom, but when you basically constrain it to only have planar motion, that it only will have two translations and one rotation. So each rigid body has basically three degrees of freedom. Now let's say your set of rigid bodies has n rigid bodies, right? Here n is two. You have two rigid bodies. Sometimes you have five rigid bodies and so on. So if you have in general n rigid bodies, then you can show that the degree of freedom for the whole set is equal to 3 times n, where n is the number of rigid bodies, and then minus 2 times, uh, now here it doesn't matter how you call it, r, and then minus 1 times c. And what are these? So n here is the number of rigid bodies. R is the number of uh, restraints. that eliminate two degrees of freedom, which in our case, in 2D cases, is either a pivot or a slider. And then C is the number of contacts or the number of restraints that eliminate one degree of freedom. 
And here, for us, it is just contacts. How many contacts do you have? Okay, and again, it quite makes easy sense because the contacts only take one degree of freedom. So if you have C of them, C times one out of the entire degree of freedom of all system is gone. These R's, if it's the number of those restraints or constraints that take away two degrees of freedom, so if you have R of them, then two times R is taken out of the whole thing. And how much do we have in the beginning? Three times N when N is the number of rigid bodies. Each one has three degrees of freedom, right? So it completely makes sense. Very easy, right? You have this whole thing and then you take away these with the constraints. And this is how much you are left with. So when you have this here, if you know, this is a simple truss, basically, right? This is the simplest truss that you have in 2D. And if I want to calculate the degree of freedom for this whole thing, what is the degree of freedom according to Grubler? So how many rigid bodies do you have that ideally can move? A, B, and B, C. So you have two. So you're going to get three times two, and then minus. Do you have any contact? And contact is not like a pivot okay so they are they still move in one direction but in the other direction they are limited by contact something like gears okay or cams or stuff like that so or an object that is uh, no actually <clears throat> if it's free to move on the surface that's fine otherwise if it's a slider is too so it's mostly gears and cams in this course and uh, so you have three times two and that sliding contact, I'll, I'll show you, not a slider, sliding contact, there are different things. So here, three times two objects, and then how many pivots do you have here? I have one pivot, two pivot, three pivots. So each pivot takes two degrees of freedom and I have three of them. There is no uh, contact here, so what would you get here? Yes, you get zero. And zero means what? Means this guy is not going to move. Means this guy is stationary. And so what do we call it when it's stationary? We don't call it a mechanism, we call it a structure. So this is a structure. And yes, it is, it's a truss. Right? This is the simplest truss that you have, you can have in 2D. It is a structure. It has degrees of freedom equal to zero. Sometimes you even have negative degrees of freedom. Negative means what? Your system is over constrained, right? So let's look at some examples here. Now, if instead of that, I look at the slider crank mechanism, right? The piston mechanism. So what you have here is this guy, right? This is your slider crank mechanism. So what is the degree of freedom here? How many rigid bodies do you have? This is one, this is one, and the piston is one. So you have three, so it's three times three minus how many uh, contacts do you have that take one degree of freedom uh, two degrees of freedom off you have one pin you have two pins you have three pins and then you have a guided slide okay guided slide takes two degrees of freedom off why because if this piston was free to move it could move along x it could move along y and it could spin about z but now all it can do is move along x so this guided slide takes two degrees of freedom off, so it acts like pins. Okay, pin the same thing, right? When you pin something, it cannot move in along X or Y anymore, only it can do spin about Z. So pins and guided slides take two degrees of freedom off. So you have one guided slide, one pin, two, three, so you have overall a four. So it's going to be two times four, so you want to get what? One. So this guy has one degree of freedom and therefore it can move and all you need is since you have one degree of freedom it means what first of all it can move it 
second of all it just needs one input which means if you determine the motion of one of the rigid bodies here if you force it the motion of the others will be determined from kinematics formulas so if i want to know the velocity of the piston all i need is to provide an rpm to the crank link i don't not also need to provide an input and let's say rotational velocity to the con rod all i need is one input the motion of the other ones if you remember the example we solved we had omega a b and then we found omega b c and v of c so everything else was determined just by one single input okay because you have one degree of freedom and when you have one degree of freedom you call your system a mechanism okay so mechanism is not everything that is moving not only it has to move it should only have one degree of freedom and you call it um, a uh, mechanism the other example is the four bar linkage right so in the four bar linkage that was one of the other examples that we solved you had this thing right and here again if you calculate the degree of freedom you have one two three members so it's three times three then minus what one two three four pins so you again you're going to get one so this is also a simple mechanism it's called four bar linkage the top one is called the slider crank mechanism and they can move right now let's look at this one that we just have in this example because that was the first question i asked does this guy move how do i know and how many inputs do i need for this do i need one or two inputs or what so if i go here Now look, what about this? How many rigid bodies do you see here? Yes, this one and this one, two. So it's going to be three times two minus. How many pins do you see? Pin here, I mean the ones that connects two objects together. So you have one pin here and one pin there. That's all you have. So two times two. This is not a pin, okay? This is just one object one uh, tab or knob moving inside the con the slide okay so this is not a pin pin is when the two are like they cannot separate they cannot move with respect to each other at that point but here it can so here you have a contact and this one is different from this one why because here this slot that you have is fixed so if the uh, guide of the object that is sliding, if the guide is fixed, it takes two degrees of freedom away. But if the slide that you have, it can move itself right here. This slot can rotate. So it's not a fixed slide. Therefore, this does not count as a fixed slide. It actually is a contact. So you have one contact here only. This guy with the surface of the slide has contact. So if you calculate this, you see that this also has one degree of freedom. Okay, so I want to mention here that when I say slider, let's not call it slider. That might be a little bit misleading. I would call it fixed slot or fixed slider or fixed slot, whatever you want to call it. Uh, or let's call it like this slider with fixed guide that might make sense better okay so this one has one degree of freedom and you might wonder are there stuff that have more than one degree of freedom yes most of the robots, almost all of the robots that you see in real life, they have um, 
more than one degree of freedom. But before I look at the robot with you, I want with you to look at the gear. So what do you have when you have a gear set? When you have a gear set, how many degrees of freedom do you have? This is a gear set. So here, the two gears are pinned down to the ground, right? So I have this gear pinned down. It is spinning about its axis, the same for here. So what is the degree of freedom for two gears together? Well, you have two rigid bodies, so it's three times two minus. You have one pin and two pins, so two times two. And here at P, the gears have what? Contact with each other. So it's minus one times one. So what would you get? Yes, one. So this system has one degree of freedom. Therefore, if you provide the motion of one of them, let's say this one, the other one will be what? Determined, right? So if you know this, the other one will be determined. You don't need to also determine the other one, force it from outside. No, you just need one of them to be determined by a motor or something. The other one will follow accordingly, okay? But now, if I go back here, and the same goes for chain sprocket, and the same goes for pulleys. Now, if you have a robot like this, okay, and here we assume that this member is, all it does, it just, uh, spins about it so this is a 2d problem so if you look at this manipulator so what you see is link a b can spin link b c can or rotate link b c can rotate and then c d that's all so it has basically literally three degrees of freedom but i want to show it to you so here this guy this vertical member is attached to the ground it's not spinning so only this one does rotate, this one does rotate, and this one can rotate. But if you want to calculate degrees of freedom here also, we know it's three, but if you see here, I have one rigid body, two, and three, so it's three times three, then minus, what do you have? You have one pin here, you have one pin here, and you have one pin here, so it is going to be two times three. What do you get? 9 minus 6, it is 3. So this robot has 3 degrees of freedom. So if you want to know, for example, how this end of the robot, this is the problem we solved in the classroom, how this end of the robot moves, what is the velocity or acceleration of this end point of the robot, which we call end effector. If you want that, you need to know what? You need to know omega AB, you need to know omega BC and you need to know omega CD. All three of them should be given to you. And you've seen that problem, they are. If you want to know how the end effector is moving. And last one that I want to show you is this guy that we solved in classroom. And I mentioned that it's this planetary gear. This one actually has two degrees of freedom okay this one does have two degrees of freedom and uh you might wonder how or why let me show you that so planetary year and this is what you know this is what you would use i mentioned it in uh, automatic transmissions so if you look at the planetary gear, I want to show you a 3D view that helps you understand this better. Yes, this is the good one. Uh, let's see if I can go further down. Okay, come here. Give me yes, this figure. Okay, here, right? So, see, I can, no, I cannot clean that, but that's okay. 
So here, if you look at this planetary gear system, which is an interesting one, so here, uh, well, actually this is not so revealing, if you don't mind, let me get rid of this. Yeah, I need a better one. I need to show it from the other view so that you can see the sun gear. That wasn't the best one necessarily. Uh, maybe this one looks better to me. Okay, let's see if it allows me to make this guy bigger. There we go. So, if I want to look at this and calculate the degree of freedom, so when I want to calculate the degree of freedom of this, all I need is actually one of these planet gears. The three of them are not needed. So I can just focus on one, so I can neglect this guy, and I can neglect this one. They are not really affecting the degree of freedom. So all I have is the ring, the planet gear, the planet arm, this uh, basically uh, right tongue shape, like the uh, Benz company. Uh, logo and then the sun gear right so I have four rigid bodies sun gear the planet arm the planet and the ring and so my degree of freedom is going to be three times four and then minus now what you have is the planet arm is pivoted at the center so here you have a fixed pivot the planet arm is pivoted at the center, the sun is pivoted at the center, and the ring pivoted at the center. So here you have three pivots on the top of each other, each one for one of the rigid bodies. And then you have one pivot here, so you have four pivots, so it's two times four. And then how many contacts do you have? You have one contact here between the, pla the planet and the ring, and you have one contact here between the planet and the sun. So, okay, so you have two contacts. That's three pivots, and this is one pivot. And in general, you have four rigid bodies. Right, which is this one, this one, this one, and uh, this one. So two contacts, it's one times two. And you, if you look at it, you have two degrees of freedom left. So in order for a planetary gear system to move, you cannot just provide one input, let's say, to the sun gear. So if you want the system to move, what you can do is, for example, you provide an omega to the sun gear, so you call it omega of the sun, then you also need to provide an omega to the ring gear, so you, this one you call it omega of the ring. These two you determine, and then you take the output from omega of the arm. So this, as this arm rotates, you say, how much is this? So if you want one output, you need two inputs in this system. And when you switch which two inputs are in, which one is out, then you can get different speed ratios. And that's the secret of this guy. It can, in general, give you six different speed ratios depending on which two you take as input and which one you take as output and how you reverse the order and so on and so forth. So this mechanism, and it's not really a mechanism because it's two degrees of freedom, but this system can provide six different speed ratios and it has two degrees of freedom. Good. So I guess now I could completely clarify for you. I know it wasn't in your lecture, but believe me, this is really important. And this is not a topic that you had in, or you, you can see in your textbook or anywhere 
in our courses. So it's good for you to learn that. Now, let's go back to the topic. So now the question is this. Here, I know this guy has one degree of freedom, so I want to determine the omega of one and I ask you to give me the omega of the other. So this is what I do. In this case, I say, I know omega of AB, this is like 10 radian per second counterclockwise. You tell me how much is omega AC, okay? Then how would you do that? Well, if you know from the past, you start from uh, the member that you have something, you move toward the member that you don't know something about. So here, if I know omega AB, what do I do? If I know omega AB, I can calculate the velocity of this point A, right? I say V of A is V of B plus omega AB cross R of A with respect to B. But what is the problem? Guess what? This point A if by point A, I mean the position of this small knob here, this point A, does it belong to this left member? No. This small knob is on the right-hand side member. So this point A does not actually belong to this member. Therefore, I cannot use this formula that I learned here. This is only good when A and B are both on the same rigid body. In the case of here, again, if omega AB is given, let's say, for example, 10 radian per second counterclockwise, and then somebody says, okay, so what is omega AC? Or let's not even put a direction for it because it might be wrong. What is omega AC? Direction and magnitude. And I give you the length of each member. I cannot say this. Omega of the left member cross R of A with respect to B. Okay? Because, again, point A, this point, this knob, belongs to this right member, not the left member. It belongs to the right member. Okay? So I can say this. I can say V of A is V of C. plus omega AC cross R of A with respect to C, but and V of C is zero, but I don't know omega AC. Omega AC is one of my unknowns. So this one is not going to go anywhere. And the top one cannot be written. This is wrong. So how do I solve this problem? And the way that you handle this problem is you consider an imaginary point an imaginary point on member BA which is at the top of physical A at the moment. What do I exactly mean? So this is how you handle this problem. You say, well, if I look at this member with the slot, here, I consider an imaginary point on this slide, a point. Of course, it's not a physical point because it's in the air, right? It is on the slot. But if such imaginary point exists and that imaginary point always keeps its distance from point B to be this fixed distance. So that point, whatever you want to call it here, I call it point A1. This point A1 is an imaginary point on member on the left at this fixed distance, whatever it is, from B. 
And then I have the actual physical point A, the knob. And if you don't mind, I call that point A2 instead of A. That has always this physical distance in green from point C. So A2 is an actual point belonging to the right member. A1 is an imaginary point belonging to the left member. But A1 and B, they belong to the same object. A2 and C, they belong to the same object. Therefore, I can write V of A1 is equal to V of B plus omega of the left member, which if you want, I can call it A1B, cross R of A1 with respect to B. And then V of A2 is equal to V of C plus omega of A2C cross R of A2 with respect to C. These two, for sure, I can write. Good. Now, V of A1, I can definitely find here because I know R of A1 with respect to B. Once I know the length of the members at the moment or this distance in red and the distance in green and the angles, right? This angle and this angle, as you're going to see in the example we're going to solve. So once I know the distances and the angles, I can find V of A1 because I know omega AB, I know R, I know V of B0, so I can definitely completely find V of A1. But what about V of A2? I know V of C is 0, I know R of A2 with respect to C, but I don't know what? Omega A2C, I don't know omega of the uh, uh, right member. And since I don't know V of A2, the bottom one is not going to go anywhere. It has more unknowns than equations that they give us. It has three equations, two unknowns. The top one is perfectly good. The only question I have is, what is velocity of A1 with respect to A2? Or, which is V of A1 minus V of A2 actually, right? That's the relative velocity. How does A1 move with respect to A2? Remember, if I draw this in a fraction of time after this point, what you would see is if this guy is rotating in this direction, so you would see something a little bit off like this, right? And then this member also would turn a little bit clockwise like this. So if this is the slot, let me see if I can draw the slot for you. And then this member, with the knob, would probably come here a little bit. Of course, this is too big of an angle, but I can bring that knob here. So this is going to be this member. Okay. So point A2 gone from the red point to the black point, but point A1, the imaginary point, is now here. Because it has to keep this red distance fixed. So... They move with respect to each other, okay? They cannot always stay on the top of each other. Because they have to keep the red and the green distance fixed. So they move with respect to each other. But how fast and in which direction? So if I call this a vector, what is the magnitude of that? What is the direction of that? Magnitude of that is not so easy just to guess, okay? But what about the direction of this uh, motion? At this moment, this knob, how can it move with respect to a point which is on the slot? Or how can it move, in other words, with respect to the slot? Of course, it can only move in this direction, right? 
Agree? That's the only direction for the knob to move with respect to the slot. Align the slot. So if I call this direction of the slot, which by the way is the same as direction of this member on the left, if I call this unit vector u, okay, then I can say that this guy here has a magnitude that I don't know, but it is definitely a line what? Unit vector u, and u I can find because I have this angle here. I have the angle of the member on the left. So I can definitely here, if I want to mark which one I know and which one I can find, VB, I have this one, I have this one, I have this one, I have, and this one, and U. Okay. And then which one I don't? Well, this magnitude I don't, and the magnitude of omega I don't. So if you now compare equation 1, 2, and 3 together, so what you need is, if you subtract 1 and 2, the left side of it is going to be what? V of A1 minus V of A2. And the left side of 3 is also what? V of A1 minus V of A2. Therefore, the subtraction of the right side of 1 and 2 should be what? The right side of 3. So this is what we say. We say 1 minus 2. compared to 3. If you do that, then you would see that V of B plus omega A1B cross R of A1 with respect to B. And this is a 1B, not a slash B. This guy minus V of C plus omega A to C cross R of A2 with respect to C. This thing should be equal to V A1 with respect to A2 times unit vector U. Okay? So I subtracted the two equations compared and now guess what I have this equation now how many unknowns do you have in this equation and what you can say about this equation well in this equation as you know I have this one I have this one I have this one I have this one I have this one, I have this one, and this one. All of them I know. This one I don't know, but I know it is either positive K or negative K. So I write it as its magnitude times the unit vector K. Again, it could be negative or positive. And this one is just an unknown magnitude. So here you have one unknown magnitude and another unknown magnitude. So you have two unknown magnitudes. But this is a vector equality, and vector equality always gives you how many equations in 2D? Two. One, the I components are equal. One, the J components equal. Therefore, you can find what? From those two equations, both of your unknowns. So not only you can find how fast, and based on the sign of it, in which direction the right member is spinning, you can also find how fast the knob is moving inside the slot and in which direction. Okay, so what's the meaning of this guy? I write it for you. The meaning of this relative velocity is, this is the speed of knob sliding in the slot. Or guide. This is the speed of sliding. I can find that one also, and based on the sign of it, I can say whether it's going up or down. Okay, 
So this is how we deal with these sliding problems. We have to bring into consideration the relative motion of the knob into the slot or the relative direction of sliding. And if we do that, then we can solve this problem. Okay. So before I go and formalize this first thing, or maybe let's first formalize it and then uh, we solve, we go back to this problem and we solve it. So this is how we tackle this kind of problem. So to go beyond the restriction that we had, then when we wanted to use these formulas, A and B should belong to the same rigid body. Now we're going to release this constraint. We say, now what if A and B, they do not belong to the same rigid body? Then what? Can we still relate their velocities and acceleration to each other? Yes, we need some extra terms, but yes, we can do it. And that's the goal here. So this is what we do now. Here, we have a primary reference frame, a fixed reference frame, it doesn't move. Then we have this rigid body. And then the secondary reference frame that you see here, this XYZ, is attached to the rigid body. We call it body fix coordinates. So this small XYZ actually does move and does rotate with the rigid body okay this other one if i call it cap x cap y and cap z this one is fixed but this one is attached to the rigid body good point b is on the rigid body okay point b which is on this body attached frame of course it is attached to the rigid body it belongs to the rigid body but point a does not now the way it is shown here it might be misleading because a seems to be on the rigid body but in general here a does not need to be on the rigid body a can be a free point in the space so maybe this picture is not the best maybe i have to change it and maybe i draw myself something for you which could be a little better than that picture. Of course, not in graphics, but in terms of understanding, I'm hoping I can do a better job than that of your textbook. So this is your primary reference frame. And I would call this guy chap X, chap Y, and chap Z. Here you have your rigid body. Attached to this is a coordinate frame. Like this. Let me do it one more time. There we go. This is called small XYZ. This point B belongs to the rigid body. And then here, what I have is an arbitrary point in the space. I call it point A. Okay, so maybe this is better. Then, the position vector of A with respect to the fixed reference frame, so this guy is fixed. This one is body fixed. Which means it does move with the body because the body itself is moving. So now, the position vector of A as measured in the um, fixed coordinate frame I call it R sub A. The position vector of the origin B of this body fix frame, I call it R sub B.
And then the position of the free point A as measured with respect to this rigid body, I would call that R of A with respect to B. And clearly I can say that R of A is R of B plus R of A with respect to B. It's just adding vectors together. No big deal. Now, you might wonder, R of A is meaningful. That's the position of A measured in fixed frame. R of B is the position of one point of the rigid body measured in the fixed frame. Fine. What is R of A with respect to B? What's the meaning of that? That is the position of the desired point A, the free point A, as seen from what? From the moving frame. From this moving frame, small x, y, z. And you might say, why shouldn't we just focus on R of A? If we, want, if we are interested in the motion of point A, why don't we directly focus on R A and its time derivatives? Why should we also look at it from the perspective of this moving frame, from this rigid body? Why? What's the point? Why should we always look at it from two different coordinate frames? Why not directly go with the fixed frame? First of all, why should we always uh, go with the fixed frame? Yes, if you remember in chapter 14, I mentioned that when you say in the second law of Newton that sum of the forces applied to object A is mass of A times acceleration of A, remember? This acceleration of point A or the particle at A should only be measured in which coordinate frame? You are right, in an inertial frame or Newtonian frame. An inertial frame is the one that does not have acceleration itself. So between this small xyz and cap xyz, which one is inertial? Cap xyz is definitely inertial because it's fixed. Small xyz, because it can rotate, it might not be inertial. So ideally, this one should only be what? Cap XYZ, not small XYZ. So if I can just focus on that, and this is what? What is this acceleration? This is D of D2 of RA with respect to D2 squared, right? This is this one. It's not RA with respect to B, second time derivative. It's R of A, second time derivative. So all I really need to care about is R of A. Who cares about R of A with respect to B? Why should I do that? If it's not useful in the second law of Newton, why should I even care about this vector? What's the good thing about this vector? And the answer is, not always you can measure this guy directly. Sometimes you cannot directly measure the position, the velocity, and acceleration of your point of interest, you don't have access to it. Instead, you send in what? An agent, a moving object, to measure the location of that for you. A simple example, uh, uh, maybe not simple, but one example that can give you direct insight is when we had the uh, nuclear meltdown in Japan, right? I guess it was in Fukushima. If you wanted to go and look at basically the situation with the rods or with the reactors, and here you are, a human being staying outside the reactor, and you want, and you're fixed, and you want to measure the velocity of something inside the reactor, or acceleration, or position, you cannot go inside yourself, right? So what would you do? You would send a robot in. And you try to track the robot by sending some signals back and forth, so you can measure where the robot is. And then the robots with cameras, with radars, with LIDARs, with whatever sensor it has, 
that will measure for you this uh, distance or this position vector r of a with respect to b. And so now if you want to know where that particle is with respect to you, you have to add these two vectors together, where the robot is and where the object is with respect to the robot. If you add them, you know where the object is with respect to you. So not always this guy is measurable. The other example that we're going to see in the next lecture is this one. So here you have this paddle sheet. Uh, ship and then you have the helicopter and this paddle ship has a radar that can measure the position velocity and by time derivative the acceleration of the helicopter with respect to itself yes and now let's say uh, the uh, paddle ship this is let's say this is an enemy helicopter I don't want to go into wars, and I'm not a fan of that, but uh, let's say uh, this helicopter is going to do something malicious to the ship, and the ship ran out of ammo. So it cannot basically bring this guy down. So it is asking from the headquarter on the ground to basically target this helicopter. How do they do it? This is far too away from the head ground radars, headquarter radars to get this helicopter. They cannot even see this. But this ship with this radar that is working can. So what this ship does, it reports back to the headquarter where it is. It reports its position, got from GPS or navigation methods, and also where the helicopter is with respect to the ship. And when you add those two position vectors together, now the headquarter knows where the helicopter is with respect to itself. Therefore, it can target it. Right? So that's why in many applications in real life, since we cannot directly measure the position of the point of interest, instead, we use one of our agents to do so. Good. Fine. So we wrote this guy. And now, what do we do? So, since this R of AB is measured with respect to this body, what we would do is, instead of decomposing this vector RAB along cap X, cap Y, and cap Z axis, we have to decompose it along small X, small Y, and small z axis okay because that's the only frame this guy has available to it so if i introduce to you this unit vectors i j and k on the body fixed frame i would write this relative position vector as small x times i plus small y times j plus small z times k. Agree? Because any vector can be decomposed along any direction that I want. But here, the only axes that I have are the one that I have attached to me, the ones that I can report. So, now, if I take time derivative of this, what happens? The derivative of R of A is going to be V of A. And of course, this V of A is in which coordinate frame? Of course, in cap X, Y, Z, right? Because the R, A is with respect to cap X, Y, Z. R of B, since it's also measured from the cap X, Y, Z coordinate, time derivative of that is V of B. Again, this is in cap X, Y, Z. Good. What about here, the time derivative of this guy? What is this going to be? So here you have products, right? X times I, Y times J, Z times K. They are all products. And time derivative of a product is going to be derivative of first one times second one plus first one derivative of the second one. 
So now the question for you is, from X and I, which one of them does change with respect to time as this particle A moves from this point to this point to this point to this point to this point? Which one does change? And the answer is both. X would change because A does move, right? Clearly, so distances X, Y, and Z would change. What about I, J, and K? Why do they change with respect to time? You know, they are unit vectors, so their magnitude is always stay at one. But since they are attached to the rigid body, what do they do? Yes, they rotate. So they are fixed magnitude vectors, but they do rotate. And we learned in the past, when a vector with fixed magnitude does rotate, it has time derivative. So the derivative of this one is going to be derivative of x with respect to time, which is x dot times i plus x di over d t, and then plus y dot j plus y derivative of j with respect to t plus z dot k plus z derivative of k with respect to t. And again, if we go back to the theorem I mentioned, you know derivative of i with respect to t is what? Omega cross i? Just go back to the theorem I mentioned a couple of sessions ago. This is omega cross j, and this is omega cross k. And so now, if we rearrange it, so the ones that have omega, these three terms, we're going to factor separately, and these ones that have dot terms, we're going to factor separately. Okay, so this is going to be what? This whole thing is going to be... what omega cross x i yes this is going to be omega cross y j and this is going to be omega cross z k so if we do that then we get V of A in the inertial frame is V of B in the inertial frame plus, as I said, these blue terms I factor separately, and then the green terms factor separately, so you would get, and the green terms, they all have omega in them, so I can factor omega out of that. So there's going to be X times I plus Y times J plus Z times K. And then the blue terms will be plus x dot i, y dot j, and z dot k. Yes? Now, what is this guy here? Yes, if you go back, that is r of a with respect to b, so I write it for you. And this one, which comes into play because the distance between point A and the rigid body does change, right? Because X, Y, and Z does change. It means the distance between point A and the rigid body does change. This one, I call it, I give it the name, I call it VA relative. Relative to what? relative to the rigid body. So, if I put all that together, I get my big important formula. 
that V of A is equal to V of B plus omega cross R of A with respect to B plus V A relative. Okay, and this is my big formula. Now, what's the meaning of this? How can we make sense out of this? So what's the difference between this formula and this guy? If you can see, they are very similar except for this new term, VA relative. If this guy was zero, the rest of the formula will exactly be like this. And you're right. Why this term exists? Because here, A and B, they belong to the same rigid body. Therefore, the distance between A and B could not change. But here, A does not belong to the same rigid body that B does. Therefore, the distance between A and B can change. And because of that change in distance, this VA relative comes into existence. So again, if A and B, they both belong to rigid body, I would get that formula back. So you see, this is a generalized form of this one, and it removes the restriction that A and B should belong to the same object. Here, there is no restriction. Okay, and that's this formula that you can see in your lecture. So here I mentioned for you that this one is the velocity of point A as measured from the body attached frame. So I can also call it VA with respect to small x, y, z. But what are these? What is this one? This is the velocity of A measured from the fixed frame. This is the one that we rely on, but since we could not measure it directly, we send our agent in, and then to calculate that, we need to know how fast the agent is moving with respect to us. Then there is the extra term, because the agent is rotating, that causes an additional velocity term. And then because the distance between point A and the uh, robot or the agent is changing, that is another term. Now you might say, what if the robot does not rotate when it's measuring the speed of point A? Well, then this term is zero, and you get V of A is V of B plus V of A relative to B. And guess where you have seen that? Yes, in chapter 13, right? In chapter 13, you learn that V of A is equal V of B plus V of A relative to B. But over there, this uh, secondary observer could not rotate. If you remember back then, we said that the secondary observer is only translating. But here, our observer can not only translate, it can rotate. So if you go back to chapter 13... You can see what I'm talking about. In relative motion, look. You see here? They are both looking at the motion of an interesting point, point of interest, not interesting point, I'm sorry. One is fixed, but the, only, the other one, all it can do is translate as it is looking at B. But here is more general. Here, you said your sensor can also what? Rotate at the same time. And it does happen. 
Okay, when you send the robot in to create a map of an environment and find objects of interest, not only it moves left and right, or maybe up and down, it also does rotate, especially more than a robot, you can think of a drone, if you send a drone in, right? It has pitch, roll, and yaw, all three angles, and then it can also move in the X, Y, and Z direction. So this is the most generalized formula that you can use. And then, now if you go forward with this formula, and take a time derivative of this, you get your next big formula about accelerations. So this is what I have for velocities. Now I take a time derivative. And it gives me that acceleration of A in the inertial frame is equal to acceleration of B in the inertial frame plus what? Here you have two terms, so the cross product is going to be both of them. Uh, we use the product rule, so it is going to be alpha, the time derivative of first one, cross the second one, plus first one, cross the time derivative of the second one, plus time derivative of VA relative. Okay, but for VA relative, I replace it with what it was. And if you remember, VA relative was what? X dot I plus Y dot J plus Z dot K, right? That was the definition of VA relative. Good. So now, what can we find? What was the time derivative of R of A with respect to B? If we go back here, this is R of A with respect to B, remember? And time derivative of that turn out to be both of these terms together, right? So the time derivative of R of A, B end up with what? To be omega cross R of A with respect to B and V A relative together. So if I want to go back, this guy by itself is omega cross R of A with respect to B plus V A relative. It's both of them. And we showed why. And then here, because, again, I have two components, the product, so it is going to be x double dot I plus x dot derivative of i with respect to time and then plus y double dot j plus y dot derivative of j with respect to time plus z double dot k plus z dot derivative of k with respect to time. And we know that this guy is omega cross i. This one is omega cross j. And this one is omega cross k. So we can say that. A of A in inertial is A of B in inertial plus alpha cross R of A with respect to B plus omega cross omega cross R of A with respect to B 
plus omega cross VA relative for these two. And then here, you can say, again here, you see it's omega x dot i, omega y dot j, omega z dot k. So you can factor omega out of them. And you say this is x dot i plus y dot j plus z dot k. And then plus x double dot i plus y double dot j plus z double dot k. And now, guess what? What is this guy here? This is VA relative, right? And here, this new term, I give it the definition, and I call this one A, A relative. The relative acceleration of A with respect to B because X dot, Y dot, and Z dot components are not fixed, and therefore, you will get... our final very important formula so if you here if you look here you have one omega cross va relative and you have another omega cross va relative so i can write it as two omega plus two omega cross va relative so i need a two here And then finally, plus a, a relative. And this is going to be our big, new, important formula. Acceleration analysis. So we have this one here in green, and then this one in red. These are what you can also follow in your lecture. So if you follow the lecture, so this is for VA relative, and we're going to see the other one here. Okay. And now, um, if you go back and look, if A and B belong to the same rigid body, which terms are zero? If A and B belong to the same rigid body, then VA relative and A A relative are zero because point A also belongs to the same rigid body as B is, so they don't move with respect to each other, I mean distance-wise. And so VA relative and A A relative are zero, so the fourth and fifth term are zero. You're only down to this guy, which is exactly what you had here. So you see, it's more generalized case of that. And if your observer does not spin, it does not rotate when it's observing point A, then what? Then this one is zero, this one is zero, this one is zero. So you only get A of A is A of B plus A of A relative to B, which again, we had it at the end of this chapter, right? Here. because here it he was just uh, translating. So this is the combination of everything. This is the most complete formula, this one and this one that you see in this chapter. And by the way, this guy, if you remember, let's see if you remember the names of these. So what was this one, if you remember? This was a tangential acceleration. This was with what? This one was Yes, normal or centripetal acceleration. And what was this? If you remember, you are right. This was 
to r dot theta dots. What was this? Coriolis acceleration. Right? This one was normal acceleration, and this one was tangential acceleration, if you remember. So these are the same thing. Good. So now that we got this, let's go and together we want to solve this example, but this time I have provided length. So B to this point at this moment is two meters, A to C is one and a half, and the angles are 45 degrees, and this angle is 85 degrees. Omega AB is given clockwise five radians per second. You want to find omega AC magnitude and direction. So here, let's do it with numbers. And we're going to do it using this new formula that um, we have learned. Okay, so this guy here, we're going to use this formula. Okay, so let's do it. So what I do here is I copy again this into one note. And we're going to solve this. By the way, there is a second problem for here, example 17.8, which is a very good example but uh, we're going to leave it for inside the class. So uh, if we go here and paste, so omega AB is given to us as five radians per second clockwise. And we have to find omega AC. So what we do, we use point B and A directly and we relate them to each other, although B and A there do not belong to the same rigid body, but we say that's fine. We can say that V of A in inertial frame is V of B plus omega of this object AB cross R of A with respect to B plus VA relative. Relative to what? Relative to the object on the left, relative to the slot. Okay, so this is actually velocity of A relative to the slot or to the object on the left, right? Because slot belongs to that object. But what is this one? This is velocity of A relative to a fixed frame. or D fixed frame. Where the fixed frame could be something like this. Okay, so it is with respect to this fixed frame. And if you want, I can use cap X, Y, Z. By the way, before I move forward, one second. So here, we have two accelerations now for point A, right? We have two accelerations for point A. One is this one, and one is this relative one. So again, when I write some of the forces on object A is mass of the particle at A times acceleration of A, which one of these two accelerations go here? You are right always the inertial one, the fixed one goes there. You never ever bring the relative one here. If you bring, then remember you have to come up with the imaginary forces to make it equal on the both sides. 
Okay, so that is the important thing. Now, going back here, let's see what we know about each one of these terms. So V of A, we don't know. V of B is zero, right? Omega AB is gonna be negative 5K because it's clockwise. R of A with respect to B has a two units length and the angle 45 degrees. So this is gonna be two times cosine 45 I plus sine 45 J, right? V A relative, I don't know, but I know if A has to move inside the slide, the direction of that motion should be aligned the slide itself with how, with what speed, I don't know, but I know the direction of it. So this guy, I don't know its magnitude, but I can write it as its magnitude, which is unknown, times its unit vector. And the unit vector for this is the same as unit vector for AB, which is the same as this guy. So it is going to be cosine 45I plus sine 45J. Again, I don't know the magnitude, but it doesn't matter. Now, can I solve here? Well, of course not. What do you want to solve? Because VA is completely unknown and this is unknown. So it's not going to go anywhere. But now point A and C, they belong to the same rigid body. So I can say V of A is equal to V of C plus omega AC cross R of A with respect to C. These two actually belong to the same object. And V of C is clearly zero. Omega AC, I don't know, but I know it has a magnitude omega AC, and it is either positive K or negative K. I assume positive. It might turn out negative. That's fine. And R of A with respect to C has a magnitude of one and a half, and then it has a unit vector. The unit vector here has angle 85 degree with respect to the negative x-axis. So it is going to be negative cosine 85i plus sine 85j. And again, I don't know omega a c. So now I say this is equation 1, this is equation 2. And if you look, 1 and 2, they have their left side to be equal. Therefore, the right hand side should be equal. So I say from 1 and 2, if I carry out the cross product, I see that it's k cross i. And you know that uh, k cross i is j, but there is a negative. So I'm going to get negative 10 cosine 45, and cosine 45 is the square root 2 over 2, so I can simplify and just make it negative 5 square root 2 uh, j. And then you have k cross j, which is negative i, but you have another negative going to be positive, so plus uh, 5 square root 2 i, and remember this is j. And then plus uh, VA relative over square root 2i plus VA relative over square root 2j. This is the left hand side, the right hand side of 1. The right hand side of 2, we also simplify. And so the right hand side of 2 is again k cross i, which is j, but you have negative. So this is going to be negative uh, 1.5 omega ac times cosine of 85j. And then you have negative 1.5 omega ac. sine 85i. 
And so now you have an equation, and you said their i is equal, their j is equal, and if you look at your lecture, I also added the equations here in the lecture for you. And if you do it, you're going to get two equations. If you solve, you're going to get two numbers. Omega AC is negative 10, and VA relative, or here we call it VA over A prime, is 1192. Okay, so from here, if you solve Omega AC, which was your interest quantity, is negative. Negative means it is clockwise. So this member also would go clockwise with that uh, omega and then VA relative, you find it to be 1192 meters per second. So point A relative to the slot is moving in the positive direction of unit vector. So basically the direction of slide is this direction. A moves in that direction. This is VA relative. It moves toward the end of the slide. And this member, as I said, will go uh, I'm sorry, this member, I guess I made a mistake, this member goes clockwise, because you saw it's negative. Okay. So this is omega AC. Negative. So that's how this mechanism works. This comes down, that goes forward, and then the A goes toward the end of the slots. Okay. Thank you so much, and we'll continue in the next lecture.